from the letter to the church at Colossae, Colossians chapter 3. I'd like to read three passages and then build on our text to help us begin to walk in a different level with God. Something is happening to the church today. It's, it's undergoing a significant change. And it's a very dangerous position. I believe that there are reasons for everything. Either our reasons or God's reasons. Some we know and some we will not. But I do believe that there are reasons for everything. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul defends his gospel. It's an interesting story. Time doesn't allow me to go into all the nuances of it. But when you read over in the book of Acts, the Bible tells us about the first Jerusalem council. At the first Jerusalem council, there were many different people there who had various views of Christ. There were a group called Judaizers. The Judaizers were those who probably gave in to the, new, the newness of Christianity but refused to give up their legalistic practices. They were comprised of some who were Pharisaical and maybe even a little Sadduceical. And the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee is that Pharisees believed in the resurrection and life after death. So because they believed in the resurrection and life after death, they were very fair, hence Pharisees. Then you had Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. They did not believe in life after death. So as a result of that, they were very sad, you see. <laughs> and so they were always bumping heads with each other. But from that group, they developed what was called the Judaizers. Another group that was represented was what I like to call the Pentecostal Christians, the ones who had just experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, who were still reeling with the newness of tongues, didn't have much formal education, but just enjoying Jesus. They were invited to this council because they were witnessing and sharing the grace of God and uh, the Judaizers wanted to keep it organized. Now also at that council were two men who had taken both, one was extremely trained in the Jewish customs and laws. In fact, he was a Pharisee. In fact, he was a member of the Sanhedrin council and I speak of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was also at that Jerusalem council. With him was his first road buddy, Barnabas. And the two of them, because Paul was more introverted, he was the more educated one, but yet he was extremely introverted. And Barnabas was the people person. Barnabas was the one who could engage in conversations. And it was Paul, uh, Barnabas that took Paul and introduced him to the big shots of the church. And the Bible says at the end of that Jerusalem council, Paul writes in the book of Acts, well, Luke writes, he says, they noticed that Paul and Barnabas were preaching Jesus, and so they extended to them what has been adopted as the right hand of fellowship. It meant that they were simply saying, we do have differences of opinions. Yes, you do believe that grace is totally free and that there are no religious encumbrances, one can simply follow this mystical Jesus. We still hold on to legal components of it as Judaizers, 
but will acknowledge that what you're doing is right. So they gave them the right hand of fellowship. Unfortunately, when they left Jerusalem, the Judaizers felt threatened. They felt that something was taken from them. And so, unfortunately, as small people do, they followed Paul. They designed a, a plan that said some of you will follow Paul to whatever place he goes. And whenever he preaches this Jesus, you come back with some Jewish legalism to try to hold the people in check because we don't want them to have such freedom that they forget that being part of this, this life of God brings requirements. That you can't wear certain things, you can't eat certain things, you can't go certain places. And we don't want uh, this new life to discredit the old life. But they picked on the wrong person. Because while Paul was indeed educated, uh, history tells us uh, the, the teacher Gamiel was his, his, his mentor, his rabbi, if, if I can use that term. And uh, Paul attended what we would call the University of Jerusalem. History says he spoke 13 dialects, not languages, dialects. And that's important to understand because some will say Paul spoke 13 languages. But he spoke 13 dialects, and dialects are different. I speak Italian. But when I talk to some people from Sicily, they speak in a Sicilian dialect. While it is Italian, I may not understand every word they say because it's dialect. It's, it's the same situation with us that are African American. When, when, when uh, 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 Japhethites listen to us, they wonder what we're talking about. What's up? Well, the Japhethite says the sky is up. But for you and I, we know that that means how are you feeling? It's a colloquialism for us. In fact, we can ask a whole series of questions with one body movement. <laughs> you see a person, oh, well, let me tell you what happened. I lost my job, and that was just, you know, Japhethites will walk up and shake a hand, simple movement. With us, it's, it's, it's an it's a exercise. Because this is, this is the dialect concept, we, 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 because it's indigenous to the area, and because of Paul's training, he could speak what was indigenous to the area. So uh, the, the idea is he was highly educated. Why would God choose someone who is highly educated when he was going to give him a gospel that was contrary to his education? You ponder that for a while. This man writes with such eloquence not to destroy the law, but to prove that it no longer has the power that it once had. His greatest writing concerning the law is in Galatians chapter 3. We'll get there. Don't turn there yet. And so when you find out what Paul is teaching... Sometimes you will notice one of the most serious problems with our canon. There's nothing wrong with our Bible. Our Bible is perfect. It's the word of God. But one of the most serious problems is that our Bible is not given to us in chronological order. There are things that are written on one level that happen at or before a later book. For example... Genesis is always our first book. It's our first book because it gives us the story of creation. But it is not the first book of the Bible. Job is. Because when you read the book of Job, there is mention of God and the devil, but there is no mention of the law. And for the law to be so serious that it is mentioned in every other book, one needs to ask, why isn't it mentioned in the book of Job or Job or however you want to pronounce it? Because none of us in here will go to a Job tomorrow. And so why is that an essential component to your studies? Because we are people who study in the written order, not necessarily in the chron chronological order. 
When history is revealed to us, it's revealed in the chronological order, and we miss it from the word of God. So it is incumbent upon us as students to string it together so it makes sense. And so now when we go to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, you will notice the apostle is saying something here that is, it seems to be, if, it, it, if you took this thing from a purely literary standpoint, he is going to say something that seems to be the result of a previous discussion. The King James in its uh, language uses the preposition if. However, in the Greek, the if isn't the word that's used. In the Greek, it's sense. And when you read it with the sense, S-I-N-C-E, it seems to flow from his previous writing. And yet, it looks not only like something that goes with his instructions to the Colossian Christians, but it also seems like something that flows from his teaching in Galatians. It seems like something that is appropriate for his teaching in Ephesians. It seems like something that is dynamic from his teaching to the Romans. He says to the Christian, since you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. The verb to seek is in what we call the divine imperative, meaning it's a command. You don't have an option. Since you are risen with Christ, seek the things which are above. In short, Paul is saying, when you become a Christian, you should be willing to change your thought process. Why? Because you're a Christian. Isn't it amazing that we can settle in to a vacation? When you uh, get into vacation mode, you're a different person. You are a different person. You, you, you dress differently. You behave differently. And here's the big one. You eat differently. You go 50 weeks holding on to your dietary restrictions. You make sure you lower those carbs. You don't take in all that fat. You stay away from, you know, certain things. But let's just say, for example, God blesses you to go on a cruise. When you get on that cruise, you say, it's just one week. I ain't going to die. You eat pork bacon. You, eat, you, 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 just, you just go nuts. You have three desserts, 14 of this, that, and the other. Because all a cruise is is eating. You have to discipline yourself. I am the only person in the world who weighs less when he comes off of a cruise than when he goes on it. And I do that intentionally to prove that I'm not a slave to that boat. Because once I see Mickey, amen. But understand, you change. Everything about you changes. You sleep a little later. You, you kind of, you know, drag yourself around. Why? Because you are seeking to become part of the environment with which you are involved. But yet as a Christian, here's what we do. We take Christ, we take the world, and we try to bring the two of them together so that we can try and figure a way to be a Christian but live close enough to the world so that the world won't ostracize me. I don't want the world to talk about me. I don't want them to put me down. So I'll live close enough just so they think I'm not a fanatic. Isn't it amazing? They'll call us a fanatic, but they'll call that person who spends $700 to watch the Sixers a fan. We're fanatics. They're fans. Well, I'm a fan of Jesus. I kind of like him. I, I enjoy being in his presence. I, I like knowing that he's going to take care of situations for me. I don't always know how, but this is the thing that you and I struggle with. We don't know how he's going to work it out. And so we are forced by our teachers and preachers to just trust God. But on two occasions, we are demanded, we are commanded, we are invited to inquire as to how the kingdom works. Jesus gives the first uh, invitation in Matthew's gospel chapter 6. He said, seek first 
the kingdom of God. And that word seek means to inquire. Find out how the kingdom works. Then Paul comes later and says, if you are risen with Christ, since you have been born again, then you need to find out how heaven works. Many of us become Christians, but we don't know how it works. And so then we are left to the capricious teaching of those who try to milk us for our money and control our lives. We need to find out how this thing works. There is nothing that you involve yourself in that you don't investigate how it works. Everything in your life comes with instructions. Box cakes. Even uh, I was buying noodles at the market. I flipped it over to see the nutritional guide, and there's, there is directions for how to cook noodles. Now, you don't need no blasted uh, directions. You throw them in the water until they get uh, soft. And you say, well, how will I know when they're ready? When you take them out and throw them against the wall. If they stick, they're ready. You don't have to be putting no, they do the same thing with spaghetti. You put it in and then you throw it up. If it sticks, it's ready. You got to be doing all that. Give me 20 minutes on a timer. That stuff is for cooking shows. But those of us that were raised and we didn't have a timer. You didn't have a digital clock. You experienced it and you came up with ways. You didn't have no clock for how to determine if the cornbread was ready. You stuck a toothpick in the middle. If it came out with dough, it wasn't ready. Isn't that amazing that now that you're sedity, you got all these pots that, that are coated and Teflon so nothing sticks. And then you got all these timers and the food still doesn't taste any good. That's how religion is. Religion is just a bunch of timers and fancy pots, but it ain't producing nothing. We need some folks that's been thrown up in the air and thrown against the wall and subjected to a toothpick where God can say, now you're ready. No one in this Bible that was used by God was, was just thrown into ministry. Everybody used by God went through hell. Every one of them. Before they could do anything for God, God had to put his foot in their chest and show them, I am God. Moses, you want to kill some Egyptians? Get over here and let me kill you. David, you want to do what you want to do? Let me let the lion and bear come and challenge you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you want to let the king know you're not bowing down? Let me throw you in the fiery furnace. Daniel, you want to pray? Let me throw you in the lion's den. My God, saints, you want what God has, but you're unwilling to pay God's price. Ah. Notice what he said. Find out how it works. Find out how it works. How does heaven work? Most of you got saved and you started thinking about going to heaven. Didn't find out anything about the travel agency. Didn't know what tools God was going to use. Didn't know if you needed a passport or nothing. You said, I'm on my way to heaven. That's the longest trip. People say, Jesus is on his way back. No, he's not. Jesus is not on his way back. It doesn't take him 2,000 years to get here. He's coming back, but he's not on his way. He's soon to come, but he's not on his way. The reason why he's waiting is to get you right. He's waiting till we get ourselves together. He's ready to come back, but we're not ready for him to come back. Seek. Seek. After, after you begin to find out how does heaven work, look at the concepts Jesus taught to us in Matthew's gospel. The, heaven, the kingdom of heaven works in weird ways. Turn the other cheek. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Heaven seems to be dysfunctional. The, 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 the Babylonian hemorrhagic code says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But the Bible says, I say, turn the other cheek. It's, it's contrary to, to, to the world. It's contrary to your thought process. The world says get and you'll have. God says give and I'll give more. It's the exact opposite. And so Paul says you got to study it. you got to find out how it works. You have to determine that I'm going to find out. And then he identifies. He said seek where Jesus is seated. He leaves nothing to the imagination. Don't seek purgatory. Don't seek paradise. Seek heaven, the kingdom of God. 
How does it work? Then he goes on. He says, after you find out, he said, then set your affection on things above. Woo! Woo! Set your affection on things above. Set your desires on the things of God. Now, I'm sure all of us that are saved want to go to heaven, but we're not going just yet. So, but that doesn't mean that your affections are not on things above. Your affections. He says, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. And here's the big thing. For you are dead. You are dead. Dead to what? Number one, dead to the world. Dead to the worldly system. It means that you are not motivated by the things that the world is motivated by. You are not motivated by personal success. You are motivated by body inclusion. You begin to realize that when I'm blessed, the body is blessed. When I'm healed, the body is healed. When I'm joyful, the body is joyful. This is the concept that Jesus gives when he says, if any two of you touch and agree, there is a unity, there is a dynamic that comes from body understanding, body ministry. Don't think of yourself as alone. Don't think you're great by yourself. I cannot be great by myself. I need my brothers and sisters. We are part of a body. I cannot be jealous of what God is doing for you because when he's blessed, Blessing you, he's blessing me. As you get stronger, I'm getting strong. Oh, God. That's why I tell people when they get new houses and new cars, I said, when are you going to take me for a ride in my car? He said, what do you mean? I said, look, that's my car too. The Lord blessed you with it. You got the payments, but I'm riding this my car too. Come see my new house, our new house. We're body. Are you with me? If you understand we're body, we would rid the world of racism. We would rid the world of all prejudice. Because in God, there is no white, no black, no green, no blue. No, 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 no. In God, there's just sinner and saint. You're my brother. You're my sister. And I'm obligated to encourage you, to bless you, to honor you, to pray for you, to forgive you. Because that's how the kingdom works. He says, you're dead. You're dead. <laughs> There's a ride in, in Disney World, Pirates of the Caribbean. When you get in the boat, Pirates of the Caribbean, and you sail around the little water, you hear this, dead men tell no tales. And they kept saying, and that's why pirates, whenever they would bury treasure, the captain would go with two people. And as after he buried the treasure, he would kill the people that went with him so that nobody would know where the treasure was. Dead men tell no tales. That's why the mafia doesn't have any witnesses. Dead men tell no tales. They don't talk. But here's the concept in God. Dead men have no feelings. So if your feelings are getting hurt every week, you best check yourself. Maybe you're not dead. Maybe you're too sensitive. I don't like when people talk about me. Then you better get over it because if you're a child of God, they're going to talk about you. And Jesus said they're going to talk about you only, only for the sole reason that they talked about me. Ministers think, oh, people don't honor me. They didn't honor Jesus. I went to God one day, and I was having a moment of self-pity several years ago. I was walking on a beach, and it and, 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 uh, must have been about 10 years ago, and I'll never forget it. I always, when I was going to the beach, I'd walk on the beach when the sun started coming up, and I would talk to God on the beach. And that one morning, I was talking to God, and I was feeling kind of salty about my relationship with the church. And I said to God, I said, God, these people don't listen to me. I said, I go up there, and I preach till my lungs collapse, till I can cough up blood when I leave. I said, Lord, they ain't listening to me. And God let me walk about 20 feet. And then he said, they don't listen to me either. Now you know how I feel. <laughs> I never said that again. Because if someone doesn't listen to God, what makes you think they're going to listen to me? If God gave you his word and told you what to do and you don't listen to him, then how are you going to listen to me? I'm not greater than God. So I said, so then he turned around and he said to me, he said, you, I didn't tell you to try to get them to listen to you. I said, just feed them so that when they stand before me, they don't have an excuse. So I'm going to make sure I don't stand before the Lord with bloody hands. You see, Paul says here, you are dead, and the life that you have is hid with Christ and God. Means that Christ is the source of your life. 
You are not a ward of the country called the United States. You are not to look to them to take care of you. Nor are you to look to them to provide for you. As great as our police officers are, as great as our military is, they are not the ones protecting you and I. They're protecting the sinners. The people in the world, when some when somebody is trying to break into their home, they dial 911. But the saint dials Psalm 911. Same concept, just a different direction. Because if you understand the kingdom, Jesus never had a Roman soldier protect him. He had angels protecting him. If you believe God for a miracle and you know we can do the impossible, shout yeah. Yes, I believe God for a miracle. And if you trust that he'll do what he said he would, in the end it will work out for your good, shout yeah. Yes, I believe God for a miracle. You know the thing that you need looks and sounds so crazy, but no. 